I call myself a maker of boxes, clocks and cases. Each box is different because they're handmade. Anything handmade cannot exactly be the same as another piece. You know, the dovetails you've got, uh, slight proportions. But I have certain, I have developed over the years certain fixed designs. And uh, uh, even though I make boxes of different kinds, the most of the boxes that I make are of about five or six uh, designs, basic designs, and there are variations within that, but those are the basic designs. So uh, tea caddies, uh, jewelry boxes, uh, boxes, uh, pen boxes, so that sort of thing I make, and uh, and usually they're made with hand-cut dovetails and contrasting wood, and given either a PU finish or a shellac finish. I just love uh, hand tools. I think simple hand tools like this uh, hand plane is the one of the best things that you can have. You know, so you have these very simple hand tools like this plane which have been around for years and years, even centuries. And I think those tools are so good because once you start learning how to use them properly, you can do amazing stuff with it. So, you know, my hand planes, my chisels, my hand saws, especially Japanese hand saws, uh, I mean, they're just the best thing that I can think of. And of course, you know, there are power tools that makes your life easier. The router, for instance, is a very versatile tool. It's something which every woodworker, in my opinion, should have. And it really makes life easy and allows you to do uh, things which other hand tools uh, don't really allow you to do. So that's one thing which uh, I found very useful and I use it all the time. But otherwise, it's mostly hand tools and I just love them. When it comes to tools, I believe that a woodworker, at least that's what I, I think, a woodworker shouldn't have too many tools. I like to keep a few tools, the right amount of tools, because the more tools you have, uh, the less you're going to use them all. There'll be some tools that will be neglected that you won't even know about, you'll forget about, and they'll rust in some corner and be of no use to any man or beast. So it's better to have a small collection of tools, but to really look after those tools, care for them. You know, you need to keep tools sharp, you need to oil them, especially in our climate with the monsoons, they rust very badly. So uh, tools require a lot of maintenance. So uh, to be able to do that properly, I think you need to have a small collection of good tools. And uh, that's what I've done over the years. I've discarded a lot of tools that I've bought which I couldn't use or which I didn't find uh, as uh, as good or friendly to use. So I gave them away to people or tried to sell them. And uh, what you see behind me uh, is basically uh, the collection of my tools, barring my Japanese saws, of which I'm exceedingly fond. Uh, but this is what uh, my tool collection is basically uh, all about. Of course, my favorites are hand planes. And uh, let me show you a few of my good ones. Uh, these are some of my hand planes. Not all of them. I still have a few more. But these are the ones that I use most of the time. And let me tell you why. Now this is, uh, this plane is known as a number five plane. The other name for it is the jack plane. This is a very versatile plane and I use it all the time. I keep its blade sharpened all the time. It's a regular blade, nothing special. You just need to sharpen it every once in a while. And this plane performs beautifully. This is made by Shoba Industries, makers of uh, some of the finest hand tools in India. And uh, I've been using it for several years now. Uh, these two are my number fours. These are known as smoothing planes. They are basically meant for giving uh, the final finish on the piece of wood and uh, for doing other little jobs. This one is made by Stanley. Uh, I think this one, this particular one is made in Punjab somewhere because I got it uh, many years ago. 
in a shop in Delhi. In those days, Stanley didn't sell any of their planes in India. Uh, and in this one, I put a Hawk blade. Hawk is an American who makes uh, very fine uh, plane blades made of a special kind of steel. This number four is made by Shoba Industries. Again, a beautiful little plane. Both are my absolute darlings because they do such fine work. Then I have this little block plane that I bought years and years ago from Amazon. It came all the way from the USA, made in Mexico. It's uh, the bottom was plane was uh, popped and not ground very well, but over the years I've you know polished it down. It serves me very well. And the other plane which I just love is my number seven. This is a long plane. This is meant for uh, joining the edges when you want to uh, glue two pieces of boards together and you have to flatten the edges exactly. You need a long plane like this one. So this one is a number seven. It's really long, I think 22 inches. And this is made by a company called Ambika. Um, I bought a lot of Ambika planes. I discarded many of them. But this one just turned out to be an absolute beauty. It cuts so well and cuts so straight that I don't think I need to. Uh, I think this uh, is as good as the best, even $200, $400 planes that you can get in the West. And this one cost me, what, about a thousand rupees down the line, some years down the line. So that's my hand planes collection. I have more of them, a few specialized ones for making rebates and, uh, uh, you know, uh, planing tenons and stuff like that. But these are my go-to planes, which I use every day, all the time. This is my other tools cabinet. This is mostly for my chisels and my drill and drill bits. I have lots of different kinds of drill bits. You need drill bits for all occasions. You need metal bits, you need uh, brad point bits, you need Fosner bits, you need uh, various kinds of bits. And here I have these bits which uh, come with uh, attached to the counter sinks and counter bows. And these are my chisels. I don't have too many chisels, but I have these few. They're beautiful chisels. I keep them sharp as much as I can and I make sure they don't rust. These are some Japanese chisels and these are Stanley uh, chisels, the kind which are easily available in India. So these tools are what really serve me well and uh, I don't need anything much apart from these. Apart from of course my uh, favorite tools, another favorite set is my, my Japanese saws. These are again incredible tools and I think they're so accurate and they cut so beautifully that uh, I wouldn't know what to do without them. So basically my tools consist of hand planes, chisels, drills, saws, and of course marking and measuring tools, which again are very important, but that's a different board game altogether. Your question about finishes and how it affects different woods is very interesting because that's something uh, which every woodworker must take into account. And that's something you learn through experience. It's not something which is written in stone or written in the books which you can refer to. But that's something which you must learn. Now, as you know, there's so many different kinds of finishes these days and so many kinds of wood. Every wood reacts differently with every different kind of finish. So really there are so many combinations and permutations that really one just uh, cannot talk about it uh, or even learn about it, I think, uh, in a limited time frame, uh, such as what I have. I use mainly shellac and uh, polyurethane for my finishes. Some people prefer oils and, uh, uh, and uh, other finishes, but uh, like I, I prefer these two finishes, shellac and polyurethane. Uh, and I stick to these two finishes because I've learned a little bit about them over the years and they've served me well. 
My particular favorite is shellac because it's a natural product. It's made in India and it's, uh, it, there's a long tradition of using and making shellac in India. Shellac, in fact, is, uh, India is in fact the largest producer of shellac in the world and still maintains that position. So uh, using shellac is a particularly gratifying uh, thing. And uh, as far as my pieces go, shellac over the years ages, it, uh, the wood ages, and of course you have to renew shellac uh, every four or five years. It's good to give another coat of shellac to clean your furniture and uh, wooden pieces and give it a new lease of life, so to speak. Polyurethane, on the other hand, uh, doesn't uh, really need that because it's a very hard and durable finish, so it lasts for years and years. And uh, the color of the wood does change and uh, you do get a bit of a, a patina maybe after a very long time, but uh, otherwise it remains fresh for many years to come. Now this is shellac. Uh, this as you can see is an amber colored liquid. This is a kind of a, a de-wax shellac but there's still some wax at the bottom but it serves my purpose very well. And this you apply it onto a piece of wood uh, just by using a piece of rag. Uh, just a little rag will do. You just take it dip it in the shellac. Actually for polishing you need to make what is called a rubber. This is just a crude way of doing it. And here's your piece of wood. This happens to be a piece of uh, American white ash. So let's put some shellac on it and see how it is uh, transformed immediately. As you can see, it's already looking so good. I mean, that's the thing about shellac. It just brings out the grain and makes everything look just wonderful. So you need to put this on for hours and hours to get a really good uh, sheen and finish onto it. But this is the beginning and this is one way you would do it. A more professional approach would be to make a rubber, actually a this should be covered with another piece of cloth and then uh, you should apply only very thin uh, coats of shellac onto the wood and in that manner you can get a very very fine finish. For instance this tea caddy that I've made is finished with, uh, with shellac and uh, uh, I've used the traditional method of polishing it. But there's so much of dust in the Indian environment, especially in North India, that it becomes a bit of a pain ensuring that no dust gets in the way. So this is the way you use polyurethane and you can get a very, very fine finish as you can see. See the, I don't know if you, the camera can capture this, but you get a beautiful luster. Uh, with the use of uh, shellac. I think your question on what really is the problem with uh, Indian woodworking and why is the quality of uh, the products that uh, we make as woodworkers in India, especially hobbyist woodworkers, uh, not really comparable to what uh, a lot of fine woodworkers in the US and the West are making. And I think there's one major reason for that, and that is tradition. We lack traditions. It's just not about me going something, watching YouTube and saying, okay, here's the wood, here are the tools, I've got some bar tools, I've got the wood, I've got finish, and I put together something. What are you putting together? How are you making it? What's your approach? What are your traditions? What kind of aesthetic are you, what are the aesthetic traditions or the design traditions on which you're basing your stuff? We have no traditions whatsoever. I'm talking about the middle class people who get into woodworking. The mystery, the carpenter, the guy who specializes in woodworking, who's learned it 
from his father, who's you know for generations they've been doing a work. They, on the other hand, have a tradition. They have a work tradition. They have a design tradition. They make certain kinds of objects. They they see uh, catalogs uh, and they adapt. Uh, so theirs is different, but that's again a shrinking and a dying breed because uh, young people of uh, master craftsmen, uh, carpenters, are not coming into the trade they, because it's looked down upon in this country. So mostly you're having factory-made furniture, which again doesn't have the kind of tradition which a traditional carpenter in India had. The traditional carpenter in India made absolutely fabulous stuff, you know, stuff which would be the envy of any woodworker anywhere in the world, let me assure you. I've got stuff made by such people, but they're very few and far between. Whereas people like me, you know, woodworkers, middle class woodworkers, we watch a few YouTube videos and we want to start making stuff. We make eclectic stuff. We pick up something from some catalog, from some magazine, watch a YouTube video and we make it. But we do not have our designs and our work is not based on any tradition. So it cannot be good. So you need to have traditions, you need to have a work culture. And I'm really glad that people like you are today coming in and talking about woodworkers. There are other middle class people, educated people saying, hey, we want to get into this craft. We want to make things. We want to make beautiful things. We want to learn. And that is the beginning of developing uh, a culture, a woodworking culture. We need to have uh, educated people in this line because we need to develop designs, we need to uh, create a tradition of our own know-how, a knowledge base which can be shared because the problem with the traditional woodworker is that he's using methods and designs which are 100 years old, 150 years old, which he learned from uh, you know, the, the British craftsmen and today there's so much more available and things are not properly understood, not properly applied. So you have very uh, poor quality furniture coming out, very shabby sort of uh, stuff being sold and made uh, in this country. But now with this new breed of uh, educated middle class Indians getting into this uh, uh, making uh, space, I think we're going to see great things in the years to come. And uh, you know, people like you encouraging us is another uh, a great trend. I think the series that you're making, Ashika, is going to be useful for a lot of people, especially those aspiring to get into woodworking. And I would imagine even some uh, experienced woodworkers would always learn uh, from uh, or get a tip or two from other woodworkers. And the thing is that uh, people like us, uh, we have to share what we know. And what we share should be useful to others. Otherwise, why are you listening to me? If I'm just talking about myself and how great I am and how great my work is, I mean, it's of very limited use to anybody else. So I think when woodworkers share their experiences, they should share stuff which is useful, which others can utilize, get tips, get ideas, uh, or benefit from in some way or the other. I think that is very important in our woodworking community as it grows, it becomes very important to share our collective experience and uh, to uh, tell people about our stories, but to tell them in such a manner that will benefit others and motivate others to come into woodworking. Thank you so much.